After Klaus's experiment, Wilhelm used his power to seal off the space around the phase shift by shrinking the area down to Planck scale. At this astronomically small size, scientific measurement becomes entirely impossible. This would protect the rest of the universe from destruction. What remained in this location was, surprisingly enough, the Zohar. Upon the activation of the phase transition experiment, it was pulled into another lower domain. But as is the nature of the Zohar, it still remained in this domain. As a gateway to other worlds, it is never truly gone from any of them. Wilhelm retrieved the Zohar yet again and placed it in the hands of Ormus alongside the Anima Relics, which he had previously discerned the location of before the planet became inaccessible. Hundreds of years have passed since Klaus's experiment. It's at this point that the remaining humans have stretched so far across the cosmos that a new acronym is used to notate the year. TC, or Transcend Christ. Earth's reason for disappearing and its location have been lost to the rest of humanity. The planet is renamed Lost Jerusalem. Thousands more years pass, and while not much of note happens in this time, there are a few relevant events. During this time period of roughly 4,000 years, the Galaxy Federation expands to over half a million planets in the known universe. The capital of the Federation changes planets at least four times before finally settling on a planet aptly named Fifth Jerusalem. Eventually, a group known as the Immigrant Fleet colonizes the planet that they would call Abraxas. This planet becomes the base of operations for Ormus, who had transported the Zohar and the other relics of God there for protection. Many others who had managed to leave Earth before its destruction also would arrive here. Along with Abraxas, they also colonize an asteroid, Pleroma, named after their ship used for the original pilgrimage, and they use it as a site for religious practices. This collective forms a sort of independent nation completely separate from the Galaxy Federation. The people born on Abraxas are labeled the People of the Zohar. Due to their proximity to the Zohar and the relics of God for prolonged periods of time, these people and their descendants have some sort of increased compatibility link with Udu. This higher affinity for connection with Udu puts an immense strain on the individuals who make contact with him. The link puts so much mental stress on a person that it almost always proves fatal. The illness begins with headaches and fainting spells, which eventually forces the individual into a coma until their inevitable death. Around the beginning of the next millennium, the Immigrant Fleet and the Galaxy Federation attempt to begin mutual exchanges and work together. However, due to their enormous differences in philosophy and culture, they were unable to come to any sort of meaningful agreements. This inability to form a working relationship, as well as the fleet's control of the Zohar, would lead to military conflict between the two for hundreds of years. In 4400 TC, Vector, under Wilhelm's orders, releases to the public a high-speed virtual network that spans the entire universe. The original plans for this network actually date back to the time of Lost Jerusalem. Secretly using the collective unconscious as a base, this groundbreaking project was helmed by the mathematician named Carnegie. 
Because of him, the science of virtual reality was able to progress at a breakneck pace. As soon as the Unus Mundus network, or UMN, goes public, it becomes widely used across human society almost immediately due to its virtual reality capabilities, instant communication, and allowance for faster than light speed travel. In 4474 TC, the beings that would become known as Realians are beginning to be manufactured. Realians are synthetic human beings made of nanomachines created for a variety of purposes such as general housework, large scale labor, and even combat due to their superhuman levels of strength. Even though they're artificial beings, each realian is encoded with a personality consciousness in order for them to easily assimilate into typical human society. Despite their ability to think, feel, and even act like humans, realians do not have any rights whatsoever and for all intents and purposes are considered property. In addition, Regardless of their company of origin, all realians are equipped with basic programming created by Vector. The program is written to such a complex degree that only Vector personnel are able to access it. Vector also produces Assault Maneuver Weapon Systems, also known as AIMS. It's unknown who was stupid enough to say the acronym like that, but regardless, it stuck. These giant mechs are some of the most effective combat machinery available. Equipped with a wide variety of melee and ranged weapons, these vehicles become very profitable for Vector, as well as their competitor in the market, Hyams Group. Ironically enough, Hyams Group is yet another organization led secretly by Wilhelm. Due to a large push by Dmitry Yuryev, the Life Recycling Act is signed into law. Whether this is the original Yuryev or a clone of the original is unknown, but he is nonetheless ruthless. In order to effectively utilize what was seen as dwindling human resources, the Life Recycling Act was proposed in order to recycle the bodies of dead humans. During their lifetimes, humans were able to sign up as donors, and upon their deaths were reborn as cyborgs by the company Ziggurat Industries. These cyborgs would retain memories from their lives and be able to continue living with cybernetic implants as well as genetic modifications. However, electing for this procedure strips the participants of their human rights and forces them into employment with Ziggurat Industries. In the year 4667 TC, Captain Jan Sauer and his team are tasked by the Galaxy Federation to investigate a series of murders on the planet Abraxas. This team is composed of Jan himself, Eric Weber and Mikhail Ortman, two UMN dive operators, Bugs, a combat support robot owned and maintained by Eric, Melise Ortis, a rookie officer, and Lactus an early model realian specializing in UMN data acquisition and analysis. The terrorist attacks in question were somehow committed by a mysterious individual known as Voyager. This person was able to find a way to hack into the UMN and murder people within the network. His attacks are also marked by verses from Chapter 6 of the Book of Revelation. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Revelation 6, 12. While on assignment, Jan befriends a nurse named Sharon Rosas and her son Joaquin. Over the course of several months, Jan and his team work closely with Sharon and begin to unravel the cause of the mysterious deaths. Sharon and Jan become extremely attracted to one another during the investigation and are quickly married. Unfortunately for them though, they start to get too close to the truth, that Voyager is employed by none other than Dmitry Yuryev. Before his connections to Voyager are fully discovered, he uses his pull within the Abraxas government to have Jan and his team removed from the investigation, and later arrested after they refuse to stop pursuing the truth. When that was not enough, Yuryev instructs Voyager to brainjack Mikhail and attack them. After being defeated, Mikhail warns his friends that Voyager was close and succumbed to his wounds. 
Mikhail's body is brought to the hospital to determine how Voyager was able to infiltrate his mind. Through deep analysis of his tissue, they finally come to the realization that Eric had been operating as Voyager all this time. The remaining team members track Eric to a UMN dive bed which cannot be disabled, so they're forced to dive in after him. Inside, Eric appears before them and explains everything. He was a result of experimentation on designer children in 4591, and it's because of this that he was born with a congenital brain disorder. This disorder led to him becoming uniquely linked with the UMN, and through his many deep dives into it, he encountered Udu, who showed him a vision of the destruction of the universe. It was in this instant that he formed a contract with Udu. Fearful of the idea of the collective unconscious and the end of everything, his mind splintered, and he began operating as a voyager in order to liberate others from their fear of death. Eric requires a special drug that regulates his metabolic rate in order to live. He receives this drug from Yuryev as payment for his work as Voyager. Yuryev, in return, uses Eric to murder political opponents and manipulate the government for his own means. As Eric's consciousness fades away and dies, he finally reveals that Voyager's plan will come to fruition. With his death, he will become something so much more. He will leave his physical body behind. In order to fulfill his contract with Udu, he will murder tens of thousands of the people of Zohar at the Archon Cathedral on Abraxas. To Jan's horror, he realizes that Sharon and Joaquin will be there when it happens. Immediately, Lactus clutches his head in agony as a mysterious voice speaks in his mind. Unbeknownst to everyone, Chaos is speaking to Lactus telling him not to fight Voyager, and to protect the Kanan within him. After this, the group exits the dive and are greeted by a message from Voyager. He taunts Jan, telling him that he should try and be on time for the church service. At the cathedral, the Zohar begins shining brightly, and painfully vaporizing each of the attendants. This energy is so great that the surrounding area begins to phase shift into virtual reality. A Voyager personally approaches Sharon and Joaquin, brainjacking them. As Jan and his team arrive at the crumbling building, a Voyager erects a translucent barrier, preventing them from moving any further. Jan is forced to watch, helpless as Voyager fires a bright light out from the Zohar, killing his wife and stepson instantly. Bugs who considers Eric almost as a father figure despite being a robot, is deeply saddened by what he's become. In a last-ditch effort to stop Voyager, Bugs attempts to kill him by self-destructing. Unfortunately, Bugs was unsuccessful, and only Jan, Melise, and Lactus remain to do battle with Voyager. During their fight, Voyager attempts to contact Udu to fulfill his side of the contract, but Udu remains silent. At this moment, time slows to a crawl, and Wilhelm appears before Voyager, offering him the power that Udu will not. Desperate, Voyager agrees and is transformed into a being known as a testament. With his body gone, what chained him to the physical world no longer remains. Thanks to Wilhelm, he is now a being purely of the imaginary number domain. A Voyager attacks Jan and his friends again with his newfound power. As they fight, Voyager gives Jan a choice, become a testament like him and live forever, or be killed and have his will absorbed. Rather than selecting one of the choices laid out before him, Jan raises his gun to his head and fires, killing himself. Unsatisfied, Voyager leaves the cathedral, where only Melise and Lactus remain. In the weeks that follow the events on Abraxas, Melise and Lactus were repeatedly questioned by authorities, but they were not believed. Melise was sent to a mental institution for rehabilitation, and Lactus was recalled by Vector for quote-unquote maintenance for a defect in his central nervous system. After the Zohar's recent activation, many across the star system became interested in the object, and thus began yet another tug of war for its power. The Federation renamed Abraxas to Mictum and put the planet under strict surveillance. 
As for Yuriev, he became focused on expanding his newly founded Yuriev Institute on the planet Zavarov in order to further research Udu. Two years after Jan faced off with Voyager, due to his participation in the life recycling program, he is revived as the cyborg Ziggurat 8. Around this time, after her release from the mental institution, Melise meets up with her connections on Abraxas, and alongside them creates an organization known as Scientia. Scientia will eventually become the largest resistance movement in the universe. In 4730, the Zor incident occurs. It's unknown exactly what sparked the conflict, but an interplanetary war began in the Milshan star system. The tensions between the Galaxy Federation and the immigrant fleet had reached a fevered pitch, and both sides were locked in combat for decades. The result of this conflict would be Milsha's loss of independence, government restructuring, and forced integration into the Galaxy Federation. In order to supply the front lines with as many soldiers as possible, genetic experimentation was employed to make use of whatever and whoever was available. The brains of the resulting uberhumans, as they were called, were altered to be perfect for one thing. Killing. Ten years have passed since the beginning of that conflict, and Dmitry Yuriev has just begun work on the Udu retrovirus, or the URTVs. The URTVs are biological clones of Dmitry using his DNA along with the egg cells of an unknown woman. As the name suggests, their purpose is to counteract Udu by emitting anti-Udu waves. You see, just as Voyager had seen the horrors of Udu, so too did Yuriev. Hundreds, maybe even thousands of years ago as a child, he was experimented on alongside other designer children in order to attempt to teleport people through the UMN without the use of any forms of protection. Every single child that participated in these experiments died, except for Dimitri. It was during this experiment that he made contact with Udu, and it changed him. Just like many others, he saw the destruction of the universe. From that moment, he was instilled with an inescapable fear of Udu and its power. Over the course of several years, these anti-Udu clones were mass-produced at the Yuriev Institute. Though all of them are technically his children, he considers them nothing more than tools to further his goals. Despite being anti-Udu lifeforms, they're never told the true nature of Udu. Yuriev feeds them a lie that Udu is a rogue AI within the UMN. 669 units were created in total, all of which have their corresponding unit number tattooed in red on the right palms. Units 001 through 665 are standard units which all share a collective consciousness and look exactly the same. Due to their experimental nature, many of these standard units would die early in life or during testing. Numbers 666 through 669, however, are different. These four units each have special powers unlike their brothers and sisters. They are known as the Variants. Unit 666, Rubido, is the most powerful URTV ever created and the leader of the male URTVs. He is a bit of a hothead, but has a good heart. His anti-Udu waveform, known as Red Dragon Mode, is stronger than all others. He is also able to control the growth rate of his cells. Unit 667, Albedo, is Rubido's twin brother. The two were originally conjoined at the back, but were separated months after conception. He is a quiet boy who loves Rubido more than anything. Since he's not very confident in himself, he looks to Rubido for guidance frequently. Albedo's special ability is being able to infinitely regenerate his cells, though this would not be known by his brothers for several years. Unit 668 Citrine is the leader of the female URTVs. Most female units are extremely unstable, and die shortly after birth, but not Citrine. 
it's this, among many other reasons, that all female URTBs are cordoned off to a special section of the facility in secret. This causes Citrine to have a bit of a superiority complex, since, in her mind, she's defied all odds, so she must be better than everyone else. She was created specifically to preserve the mitochondrial DNA of her mother's egg. Citrine's power is a type of telepathy that allows her to control the thoughts of people. She is also secretly designed to kill Rubido if he is unable to control Red Dragon Mode. Unit 669 Negredo is unlike all the other URTVs. He does not react to Udu in the same way his brothers and sisters do. This is because, unbeknownst to him, Yuriev secretly intends to take control of Negredo's body upon his death. His contract with Udu gives him the power to possess others' bodies. It is this mechanism that has allowed Yuriev to live such an incredibly extended lifespan. Negredo is the most mature of the variants, and is typically calm and collected. He shares the same abilities as Citrine, and is also supposed to kill Rubido when ordered by Yuriev, much to his dismay. In 4747, a man named Yoaki Mizrahi founded the Mizrahi Cerebral Sciences and Research Center on Mictum, along with his wife Yuli, in order to cure their daughter Sakura of her newly developing neural condition. Due to her illness, she was hypersensitive to the UMN, and because of that, her central nervous system was entirely shut down. Sakura could not communicate with the outside world. She could not walk talk, or even see. It was an extremely lonely existence to be sure, so Joachim and Yuli were determined to help in any way that they could. Joachim was, put simply, one of the greatest minds that humanity had ever seen up to this point. He had made incredible strides in many fields, but most notably in the construction of realians. This led to the production of a line of elite data collection models. Dubbed the 99 series observational units, this series of realians were nicknamed Kirschwassers. Their appearance was based heavily on Sakura. Around this same time, the Galaxy Federation attempts to perform a Zohar control experiment on Mictum. This experiment failed and caused hundreds of extra-dimensional beings to enter the real number domain. These sentient beings are known as Gnosis. They had previously only sparsely appeared throughout history, being relegated to folklore as cryptids. This appearance of Gnosis, however, was at a scale unlike anything humanity had ever seen. What makes a Gnosis dangerous is their origin in the imaginary number domain. An existence that never should have any physical contact with humans has crossed over into their realm. Due to this, Gnosis are able to shift their bodies back and forth between the real number domain and the imaginary number domain at will. When shifted, their bodies become entirely non-physical, and thus, they cannot be harmed. In addition, the form of a Gnosis is largely comprised of sodium. When a Gnosis shifts back into the real number domain, they are able to touch humans, and if they do, the human will either become a Gnosis themselves or turn entirely into salt. It's for these reasons that after they appeared on Mictum, that the entire planet was brought to ruin, and almost everyone on it at the time was killed. Everyone except a young boy named Kevin. He was launched off the planet in an escape pod by his mother, who had given her special pendant to him. She had been touched by a Gnosis, and elected to stay behind in order to protect her son. Kevin's escape pod was soon located by a nearby ship, and he was swiftly dropped off at an orphanage. During his stay at the orphanage, he's approached by Wilhelm, who tells Kevin that the universe will be destroyed one day. He explains that the only way to prevent this inevitable destruction is to keep restarting it by causing an eternal recurrence. Kevin, traumatized by his experience on Mictum, says that he hates this universe, and would rather live in a new one with his mother. Wilhelm, happy with this response, offers to make that a reality, as long as Kevin assists him. 
Kevin is then officially adopted by the Winnicott family, who enroll him in school. Almost immediately, his exceptional intelligence was recognized, and he was placed in the highest level classes possible. Kevin would eventually go on to graduate from Bormio University at just age 15. The Zohar is retrieved yet again after the dust has settled on Nictum. In 4751, the remains of the Mizrahi Center moved to the planet Milsha and became home to the Unknown Territory Interventing and Creation Agency, or UTIC. Ormus would use this organization as a front in order to secretly conduct more Zohar and Udu-related experiments. Despite being the head of the entire organization, the vast number of corrupt individuals around Mizrahi likely made it difficult to exercise any modicum of control anymore. As a result of the partnership with UTIC, a complex system of independent parts and failsafes were created in order to control the Zohar. Deep within the bowels of UTIC's headquarters, Labyrinthos, Mizrahi toiled away at his new task alongside Kevin Winnicott, who was handpicked by Wilhelm, as well as a HIAMS group researcher named Dr. Sellers. To achieve their goal, 12 Zohar replicas were created, and they became known as the Zohar Emulators. Each emulator has a record of the wave pattern data of a corresponding anima relic. The next piece was a control program. Luckily for Mizrahi, data from a Zohar control experiment from thousands of years prior still remained with Ormus. The experiment in question was the one activated by Grimoire Verum, though nobody remembered his name at this point. Verum's work on Limigaton had persisted after all of these years. Though very little from this data could be gleaned, he was able to assemble a sound wave on an acute wavelength. This sound needed a name, and so Mizrahi used a word that he was able to parse from the data. Unbeknownst to Mizrahi, he had named his control program after Verum's daughter, the same daughter who had been used as a catalyst in his experiment millennia prior. The Song of Nephilim was created. This Requiem of the End, this Song of Destruction, can only be heard by a select few, but regardless, the damage it can do is monstrous. All of his research pertaining to Limigaton had led to the creation of the Y data. The Y data contains some of the most important information in the universe. From the results of Grimoire's experiment, to the secrets of the Zohar, and even somehow the location of Lost Jerusalem itself, this data was integral to the Zohar project. Along with the Song of Nephilim, a space station by the same name was constructed in order to generate the wavelength on a large scale. The song was then docked inside this relic of God called the Proto Merkaba as its main power source. The Proto Merkaba was yet another powerful device from the ancient times of Lost Jerusalem, and Mizrahi had transformed it into an enormous space station. The final stage was much simpler a Realian. This Realian was special, though. She was the first ever transgenic type part human, part Realian. The reason for this extremely odd choice was to serve as a link between the Zohar and Udu. It had been made abundantly clear that contact with Udu led to death in a vast majority of cases. However, Mizrahi postulated that they may be able to circumvent this risk if the subject making contact was not fully human. So, Mizrahi designed a realian that was just human enough to be able to connect with Udu, but not so human that the process would kill her. To this end, Fabronia was created. And Fabronia was a success. Joachim Mizrahi's theories had been proven correct, and contact with Udu was working as intended. So, using Fabronia's genetic data, he made two clones more suited for their experiments. 
Cecilia and Catherine were created with the express purpose of linking with Udu. Unlike Febronia, who was able to live somewhat independently from Utik's grasp, Cecily and Kath were placed inside pods connected to the Zohar. Their mangled and abused bodies were nothing but tools to Utik. The nightmare-inducing visions of these children that she considered her sisters would haunt her for the rest of her life. Finally, with all the preparations made, the Zohar's power was able to be harnessed, and it would be used to power Proto-Omega, the most powerful machine ever built. One powerful enough to challenge God. While Proto-Omega using the Zohar as a power source was terrifying on its own, the real terror was the UMN Phase Transfer Cannon. This weapon would allow Omega to eliminate any target in the universe by shooting its beam through the UMN. Mizrahi was extremely busy with this project, but he spent whatever free time he could on a new type of Reallian. The 100 series would be the next step for the observational units, and great care was taken to make sure that the prototype was perfect. Of course, the advancement of Reallian technology mattered to Mizrahi quite a bit, but the 100 series prototype would serve a secondary purpose. Mizrahi was greatly affected by his inability to cure Sakura. What he was able to do, though, was try to give her a way to interact with the real world again. A way to remove her from the prison that was her body. This new Reallian would be able to link with Sakura's consciousness and allow her to walk again to speak, see, and smell again. This Reallian would be identical to Sakura's old body in every way, with the exception of now having pink hair. And so, the Multiple Observative Mimetic Organicus, or MOMO, became Sakura's only hope in Joachim's eyes. Yuli Mizrahi, however, was upset with her husband's level of care for Sakura's health and wanted to take a more proactive approach with treating their daughter. So, in TC 4753, desperate to cure Sakura's illness, Yuli divorced Joachim and brought Sakura to the Yuriev Institute for an experimental treatment. Curious at the effect that the UMN, and by extension Udu, was having on the girl, Dmitry Yuryev had agreed to help. It's unlikely that he actually cared about helping Sakura. It's much more probable that he was more interested in gathering data on Udu. To try and fully diagnose the issue, Rubido, Albedo, and Negredo would dive into Sakura's subconscious and attempt to contact her. Now inside of Sakura's subconscious, the three boys find themselves inside of a closet. After a bit of squabbling, they fall out right in front of a sleeping Sakura. The world containing her mind seemed to be a recreation of her old house, and they were inside her bedroom. Sakura stirs awake and is baffled to find that she is actually able to communicate with the boys. For the first time in what must have felt like an eternity for her, Sakura was able to speak with someone. When the boys return back to the physical world, Rubido relays Yuli a message from Sakura. That girl! That girl gave me a message. She said, please tell my mother... Please tell my mother that I love her. Uh, what else? She said, I got a seashell treasure box for my birthday last year. If you tell my mother that, she'll understand. So... The wavelengths matched up. You were able to talk to Sakura? So, what's your name? Rubida! Uh, I mean, URTV unit number 666! <laughs> Rubido. Please keep telling me the thing she says. All right? Oh. 
In the days and weeks following, Rubido would dive into Sakura's mind alone, and the two became quite close. Rubido even learned how to play the harmonica so that he would be able to play alongside her piano. Sometimes during his dives, they would speak of deeply personal matters. On one such occasion, Rubido expressed his sadness at not ever meeting his mother, and his fear that if he ever did, she would think that he was a monster due to his purpose as a bioweapon. Sakura reassures him that he's not a monster at all and asks him a favor. She's aware of Momo's construction and considers her like a younger sister, so she asks Rubido to take care of Momo and her mother for her. Rubido eagerly accepts and Sakura gives him a kiss on the cheek as a goodbye for the day. The closeness between the two bothered Albedo quite a bit. He felt as if Sakura was stealing Rubido away from him. Around this time, the boys meet Citrine for the first time and come to the shocking realization that there are female URTVs. When she introduces herself as Unit 668, Negredo tells her that he heard the missing numbers were dead. She clarifies that some of them indeed needed to be disposed of, but only nine females remained. She laments over this, considering them all to be superior to the males. Her cocky demeanor and lack of care for life angers Rubido, and he leaves the interaction not thinking very highly of her. Soon after, Yuriev organizes a special dive into Sakura's mind, the purpose of which is to make an attempt at fixing her sensory impairment. Before diving in, Albedo expresses his disgust for the standard URTV's lack of strength and willpower. In response to this, they ask Rubido why he gets to be the leader if he's just a monstrous variant. Albedo shouts at them, and Negredo tries to calm Rubido, but he's still visibly shaken by the insult. During the dive, the non-variant URTVs become infected by the Udu waves leaking into Sakura's subconscious. The boys defeat them, but Albedo isn't satisfied. He begins beating one of the URTVs senselessly over their earlier insults. Rubido begs him to stop and looks at him in fear. This angers Albedo, and he screams at Rubido never to look at him like that. After the boys exit the dive, Rubido and Negredo confront Albedo over his excessive violence. The unit in question was injured badly, but Albedo doesn't seem to understand what the problem is. He recommends that Unit 623 could just regenerate. Rubido and Negredo are confused and ask what he means. To demonstrate, Albedo pulls out a gun and shoots himself in the head to the complete shock of his brothers. Seconds later, his head returns to its former state like nothing happened. It's at this moment that Albedo realizes that nobody else can do this. They will all die and leave him behind one day. This realization changed Albedo forever. Despite the efforts of Yuli and the URTVs, Sakura would eventually die during an experiment at the Yuriev Institute. The cause is entirely a mystery. Hearing of this news, Joachim Mizrahi threw himself further into the development of Momo. He believed that Sakura's consciousness could be revived within his realion, though this would never happen. Mizrahi's Zohar research had been attracting unwanted attention from the Galaxy Federation. Fearing possible interference by the government, Utik made the decision to use their power to overthrow Milsha's government. In response, the Galaxy Federation began mobilizing troops and demanded Utik surrender and turn over Mizrahi. Unsurprisingly, they did not, and war was declared on Utik. What followed were three separate Milshan descent operations orchestrated by the Galaxy Federation forces. The first and second were unsuccessful due to the sheer power commanded by Utik. Proto Omega's power was entirely unparalleled. Nothing the Federation tried seemed to work. For the third descent operation, however, the Federation turned to Dmitry Yuriev. Commander Helmer of the Federation Special Forces met with Yuriev in person on Zavarov to discuss the URTV's role in ending the Milshan conflict. They proposed that since the URTVs can counteract Udu's waveform, they could use that ability to prevent the Zohar from transferring power to Proto-Omega. 
giving Special Forces the chance to defeat the rest of UTIC. And so, a few weeks after the second descent operation, the third commenced with the deployment of the URTVs. The Federation's troops would give everything they had against UTIC, and in the commotion, the URTVs would break into Labyrinthos to counteract Udu. Once inside, Rubido initiates a link between himself and the other URTVs. Despite all of their training, Albedo is terrified of what's in front of him. He begs Rubido not to let go of his hand. Almost immediately, though, he realizes something. Through a mysterious vision, he comes to the conclusion that the waves meant to counteract Udu will also result in an enormous amount of thermal energy, causing a massive explosion. Rubido ignores Negredo and Albedo's pleas and lets go of Albedo's hand, severing the mental link. Rubido would come to regret this decision for the rest of his life. With no link to protect the URTVs, Udu begins infecting them. The URTVs that aren't killed immediately are driven entirely berserk, and Albedo received the worst of it. Unfortunately for him, he had made a direct contact with Udu. This completely shattered his already fragile mental state, and he began killing people inside the room. In the confusion, Negredo was heavily injured. The news of the URTV's failure reaches Commander Helmer, and he instructs two of his best soldiers to search for anyone that survived the incident. These soldiers are a special realian named Kanan and Yeshua, the embodiment of Anima. Yeshua has seldom gotten involved in the affairs of humanity since Mary Magdalene died, but now he has chosen to join the Federation military. Of course, nobody knows who Yeshua is because of how long it's been, but also because he's been using the name Chaos instead of his given name. Kanan and Chaos are provided E.S. Asher, a large mech similar to Ames. While they fight through Utix forces, Sellers activates the Song of Nephilim, and the resulting sound waves further intensify the conflict. Almost every Reallian has been driven mad by the song, and they begin attacking everyone around them, regardless of their affiliation to the fight. This is because Utic has secretly been reprogramming all Reallians that come through Labyrinthos to be overly sensitive to the Song of Nephilim. Chaos immediately recognizes this sound as the fragments of Lemegeton and is visibly shaken. Just then, the Reallians fighting alongside them turn their weapons on E.S. Asher, Thankfully, before the two are beaten, Captain Jin Uzuki arrives and swiftly defeats the Reallians. With their machines damaged, Chaos, Kanan, and Jin progress together on foot, despite their different objectives. As they trudge through the hellscape that Milsha has turned into, Jin explains that while Utik is responsible for the events that have transpired today, he believes that someone else is truly to blame. Though the identity of this shadowy organization eludes him, Ormus are indeed the ones behind the Milshin conflict, and what Jin believes they desire is the Y data. Jin managed to steal a disk with a copy of the Y data on it, but a tremendous amount of protection is encrypted alongside it, so he's unable to glean much of anything from it. As they approach the last known location of the URTVs, the three are ambushed by Colonel Margulis of the Federation Army. Jin and Margulis have a storied history, being former students under Jin's grandfather who taught them the art of swordplay and had to channel ether energy. Though the details are unclear, there was some sort of falling out, as Jin believes that Margulis betrayed his grandfather. Coincidentally, Margulis was acting as a double agent for Utik, and was the person that Jin stole the Y data from. The two cross their blades in an incredible show of skill, and during the fight, a wound Jin had received earlier opens up and begins pouring blood. Margulis readies his sword, and fire erupts from it towards Jin. Unfazed by this, Jin shoots a bolt of ice in response. When the smoke finally clears, Margulis has a gash down the side of his face, and Jin falls to the ground, beaten. Margulis insults Jin, telling him that he was always the more skilled swordsman. 
Before he can finish, however, the ground below him breaks apart and he falls into the hole. This does not kill him though, and he makes his way to Labyrinthos. Nervous by this close call, Jin uploads his copy of the Y data into Kanan, saying it would be much safer with him. He asks Chaos and Kanan to save the URTVs and deliver the Y data back to headquarters in his stead, since he has something else that he needs to do. Jin heads off to look for his younger sister Xion and his parents who are staying at a hospital nearby. Kanan and Chaos continue into Labyrinthos and find an exhausted Rubido carrying Negredo, who is on death's door. All Rubido can say before fainting is that everything was his fault and that something has happened to Albedo. The two are immediately brought back to base to receive medical attention. Albedo, wounded and scared, remains inside of Labyrinthos and was eventually found by a group of Kirschwassers who took shelter with him on the Song of Nephilim. As if things couldn't get any worse, Gnosis began appearing all across Milsha. The amount dwarfed even that of the incident on Mictum just six years prior. Thousands of them poured in from the imaginary number domain, causing absolute pandemonium. In the chaos, many Utic employees abandoned their posts and evacuated the area, which prevented Proto-Omega from being deployed in any capacity. Jin arrives at the hospital only to find that his parents are dead, and Xion, paralyzed in fear, is all alone. He blames himself for not being fast enough, but pulls himself together in order to bring Xion to safety. Mizrahi watches as this catastrophe unfolds before him, and decides that something must be done. He reasoned that this bloodshed was occurring because of him, and he intended to atone in any way he could. He decides that the best course of action is to use the Zohar to overload the Song of Nephilim in order to completely destabilize the space around Milsha, sealing it from the rest of the universe and containing the Gnosis within. Seller sees Mizrahi doing this and shouts at him to stop. Joachim's will is unshaking though, and as Sellers tries to pull him away from the console, Mizrahi pulls a handgun from his jacket and fires a shot into each of Seller's kneecaps, permanently crippling him. Mizrahi secretly uploads his Y data to Momo's programming, erasing all other copies he can find. In addition to his research, it contains the truth of what really happened on Milsha, and a potential way to return to the planet when humanity is ready. Mizrahi steps outside and witnesses the destruction that he's played a part in. Momo. I made a conscious decision to sacrifice this planet and its inhabitants to you. My sins will certainly never be forgiven, but if it means you will be born into a peaceful world, then so be it. I will gladly throw myself into the fires of hell. Hallelujah! And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast, they were cast into the lake of fire, and with it came about the second death, and whosoever not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of eternal fire! Sakura, I doubt I will go where you are. You will probably admonish me for that which I have done. Hmm? Who's there? Yuli, I'm sorry. Please take care of Momo. Please take care of our child.